like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lord thou hast taught me to say Buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and his shame.
The two-minute message preview at the non-denominational New Hope Olympia is looking for peace? How can you find peace, and how can you minimize the stress in your life? When will everything be okay? Have you ever asked yourself that question? You're sitting on the couch, watching the news. You see that the economy has gotten much attention lately. Banks are getting bailed out. Car makers are begging to get bailed out. There are so many foreclosures, you see. You get tired of watching all of this, and so you change the channel, and now you see stories that show that the moral climate of our country isn't so good, as government officials fight with each other over what the definition of marriage should be. People seem to be more and more accepting of sinful lifestyles. Have you noticed? You get tired of watching that, and so you change the channel again, and now you see people fighting over how the war against terrorism should be handled. Finally, you turn off the TV. There are so many problems in the world. When will everything be okay? And then you think about your life and know that not everything is perfect. Not everything is right for you at home or work or for your health and finances. When will everything be okay? And Landers receives around 10,000 letters a month from people requesting advice on various topics. When asked her most common question, she answered that people seem afraid or worried about something. They're so scared of losing their health, worry about their job, and are filled with concerns about their family. People are whacked out about their neighbors or frustrated with their friends. A great preponderance of letters describe relational ruptures and family friction. In short, people are looking for peace but can't seem to find it. Are you searching for peace? Are you longing for it? You thought you would find it if you made much money but you didn't find it. You thought you would find it in getting and accumulating much knowledge, so you got all the degrees you could, but you didn't find this peace. You've searched the world's religions but haven't found it. There are a thousand ways you've turned, trying to find peace, but you haven't found it. When you come to Christ by faith, He gives you the Holy Spirit, who produces the fruit of the Spirit and gives you the peace that passes all understanding. Pastor Dell will tell us how to find peace in his weekend message. Also, he will share the top stresses in America with us. For the rest of the story, here is Pastor Dell. Folks, I want to thank you for watching this weekend's message. Now, the message that I am going to share with you this weekend uh, is a powerful message, and it contains the subject that I'm sure will get everybody's attention. Now, it's a powerful message. Now, keep in mind, I am not a powerful speaker. That I am not. But the resource that I draw from in preparation for my messages is a powerful book. It's called the Bible, the best self-help book available on the market today. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So, let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about how you can find peace and how you can minimize the stress in your life. Now, I'm studying from the book of Philippians, which is one of my favorite books in the New Testament. It's the book of rejoicing. And so let's take a look at chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, and let's see what it says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to say in verse 8, this is what we are to meditate on. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, 
whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. King James says, think on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the peace of God will be with you. There it is. We're looking for peace. And here's where it's found, folks. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads and our hearts in your presence, I pray today that you would take my lips, my tongue, and my mind. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. God, I know that there is nothing in me that is good. I cannot. You never said I could. You can. You always said you would. So speak to us and meet the needs of your people. And for all you do, we are going to praise you and honor you. And I pray with a humble heart and with a grateful heart. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, as you can tell, my voice isn't what it normally is. But bear with me and pay attention uh, to the words and the Bible verses of my message. Let these verses sink into you. I want to talk with you about how you can find peace for your life and also how you can minimize the stress in your life. And folks, I really believe that this message is going to be relevant to Generation Z. It's going to be relevant to the Millennials. It's going to be relevant to the Baby Boomers. It's going to be relevant to senior adults. And I know that this message is relevant to all of us. So, looking for peace. We're going to show you how you can find it and how to minimize the stress in your life. I read the story about a little boy. He goes down to the country store and he says to the country store owner, he says, I want to buy a box of Tide. And the store owner said, son, what are you going to do with a box of Tide? And that little boy said, well, sir, I'm going to wash my cat. And the store owner said, now, wait just a minute. Do I hear you correctly? You're going to wash your cat with a box of Tide? The store owner said, do you realize what you are doing? I don't think that's a good idea, he said. The little boy said, sir, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to wash my cat. And so he bought a box of Tide, took it home, and um, a few weeks later, the little boy came back into the store. And uh, the store owner greeted him and said, son, uh, how did it go uh, with you washing your cat? And the little boy said, well, to tell you the truth, the cat died. And the store owner said, well, son, I was afraid uh, that would happen. And, uh, and the little boy said, oh, no, it wasn't the tide uh, that killed him. It was the spin cycle that got him. It was the spin cycle that got him. Well, folks, I believe that a lot of us today are living in the spin cycle as a way of life. And I did some research in preparation for this message, and I discovered the top stressors in America. Number one is worry. People are worried. And the Greek word, the Greek word for worry means to divide or tear apart. And so um, someone says, I am just worried sick. I got news for you. That's exactly what worry is will do for you. So, folks, think about it. We have worries today that we did not have a generation ago. Think about it. 
uh, a generation ago, we didn't have to worry about somebody stealing our identity. Uh, we have to worry about that today. Years ago, we didn't have to worry about losing our cell phone simply because we didn't have a cell phone years ago. The number one stress in America today is worry. But there's a second uh, reason why people are stressed out. It's because of hurry. Everybody is in a hurry. Have you noticed that? Uh, I gotta run. I gotta go. And even when we come to church, if we are not careful, we are looking at our, our watch on our wrist. And uh, you know what? If the devil can't make us mad, he will make us busy. And we are living today in a very busy world. Everybody is in such a hurry to get there. Uh, we got to hurry. Don't have time to cook a meal at home. Let's swing by for some fast food. Uh, and so uh, we want to lose weight. So what do a lot of people do? They get a hold of some slim fast. Uh, what do we do when we want to uh, uh, strategize and handle our finances? Well, a lot of us use Quicken. Uh, we take some photos. What do some people do? We want a fast photo. We need to get an oil change. What do we do? Uh, we got to find that 10-minute uh, oil change. And then even when we go on vacation, we've got to get into the express check-in line because we've got to quickly get to the room and then go on with the day's activities because we all are in such a hurry. We drink our coffee on the run. And so there's a third reason why people are stressed out in America today, and that's because of crowds. And that's because of crowds. Do you realize that 83% of people in the world today live in a large city. 83% of the people living in America today are living in a large city. Do you realize back in the 1800s there was only one city that had a million people in it? Just one. You know what it was? It was London, England. Today there are over 500 hundred cities that have over a million people. Think about it. 500 cities with over a million people. Think about this. In Tokyo, there are 37.4 million people living in Tokyo. I'm talking about crowds have a tendency uh, to stress us out. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not okay uh, with crowds. But a lot of people are stressed over crowds. So there's a fourth reason people have a lot of stress in their lives. is because today we have more choices. We have more choices. My, oh my, when I was growing up uh, as a little kid, an adolescent, we only had two or three TV uh, channels that, that we could watch. And uh, today, why, we got all sorts of different channels that can draw our attention to. Uh, we have a lot of choices on what to watch on television. Man, I tell you what, you go to a restaurant and you take a look at the menu... And I mean, it's a book. It's actually a book. And so I'm thinking about all these choices uh, that has a tendency to make life complicated. Hey, have you ever tried shopping for toothpaste? Think about the wide variety of toothpaste that's available to buy today. Hundreds of them, I suppose. There are so many choices today. 
when the server in the restaurant comes to take your order, uh, she goes through a list of 10 things. Uh, what do you want uh, for your meal? And uh, so uh, choices, a lot of choices. And then there's a fifth reason why people are stressed out, and that is a loss of privacy. A loss of privacy. We don't have privacy anymore. I'm convinced that they are monitoring everything that we do and say. I pick up my cell phone and I start to uh, check on a place that I uh, want to go visit or eat out of town. And as I am researching this, all of a sudden ads start jumping up on my cell phone and uh, um, it, it, it gets so um, uh, bewildered to us that we don't have our privacy anymore. I tell you what, folks, we have a lady living in the house, and we also have a lady living in my man cave. The name of the lady is Alexa, and I'm convinced <laughs> that through Alexa, they're keeping up with everything that I'm saying and doing. I mean, they are monitoring my life. And they are monitoring everything I'm doing. They are monitoring everywhere that uh, I go. I get into my truck. And it says so many miles to my destination. And so they are monitoring how many miles uh, are left before I reach my destination. They are monitoring everything that we are doing today, folks. I mean, from the birth to the end. <laughs> I believe that we are being monitored. And uh, uh, they are monitoring when we buy baby pampers, and they are monitoring when uh, we reach the point where we have to buy those adult diapers. All the way through now, let me tell you, Here's another reason for stress. Different world views. Different world views. Years ago, basically, we had common values. Not so today. Not so today. That is why it is so imperative that we have a biblical world view. I want you to understand something. Now listen very closely. Whatever happens in my family, whatever happens with my family members, now hear me closely. Whatever happens in my family, whatever happens in your family and your family members, God's Word does not change in light of what's happening and somebody's family. It is still the Word of God. The Bible says, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of God shall abide forever. Folks, it's either the Bible or it's not the Bible. And it is the Bible. And it's so imperative that we have a biblical world view. Now, let me tell you the seventh reason why so many people are stressed out. It's the future. It's the future. People are asking, well, what is going to happen next? What is going to happen, for example, in the Middle East? What's going to happen to Israel? What's going to happen in the upcoming presidential election. Now, what's going to happen next? Uh, what's going to happen next to our country? A lot of people are asking these questions. So, here's the question. I am looking for more peace in my life. That's the question. Now, folks, I am not a a uh, anthropologist. I am not a psychologist. I am just a practitioner of the Word of God. And I want you to listen very closely. 
Uh, I'm not smart enough to preach anything but the Bible, but I'm not too smart to preach anything but the Bible. So, you are saying, how can I have more peace in my life? Well, I'm glad you're watching this message because I'm going to show you how you can have more peace in your life. And these five steps that I'm going to show you, folks, listen up. They work. They work. If you work them, they will work. Five steps. Number one, refuse to worry about anything. Refuse to worry about anything. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Look what it says. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It means simply, don't worry about anything. Now, who in the world told us not to worry? It was a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. And here in the book of Philippians, he tells us not to worry. Now, where was he when he penned these words? Don't worry about anything. Well, he was in the Mamertine prison. They dropped him down into a hole. He was in a dark, dank, dirty, damp dungeon. And he spent two years... In this prison, he actually wrote this book that we are studying uh, from the prison. As a matter of fact, he wrote four books in the New Testament while he was in prison. Ephesians was one, Philippians, which we are in today, Galatians, and Philemon. He wrote these books while he was in prison. And... Uh, so, what was he doing in prison? He was waiting, folks, to be beheaded. And my goodness, this man says, don't worry about anything. You know, folks, worry is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, uh, but it won't take you anywhere. Corey Ten Boom uh, was the lady that during the uh, World War II... She had, she had Jewish people uh, out, out of sight when they were being killed by the Nazis. She went into a Nazi consecration prison, all because of her hiding the Jewish people out. And this is what Corey Ten Boone said. Worry won't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It will empty today of its strength. Let that sink in. Worry won't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It will empty today of its strength. And so true that statement is. I learned a few years ago on how to handle worry. When I find myself beginning to worry, I turn to the Sermon on the Mount and I revisit the Beatitudes of Jesus. When you are worrying, I would encourage you to read the Beatitudes and just camp there for a while and read what Jesus had to say about worry. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27. Here's what he said. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? What Jesus is telling us here is we need to become bird watchers. Bird watchers. He says, look at the birds of the air. Now, 
You may be watching this message and someone might say to you, well, what did Dell have to say in his weekend message? Well, he said to watch the birds. Watch the birds. And that's exactly what I do, folks. Now, let me tell you something. Birds wasn't made in the image of God. We were. Birds weren't given dominion over all creation. Stop and think about it. We were. Birds don't go to heaven when they die. We do if we have a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus said, are you not much more valuable than they? And so when you begin to start to worry, folks, spring is just around the corner. The singing of the birds, Solomon said, has come. Just pause with a cup of coffee and watch the birds. And you are more valuable than they. And so, if God will take care of the birds. One of my pastimes used to be um, watching the birds uh, feed off of our, our uh, birdhouses. And uh, we had a lot of birds that would come and uh, feed off of our, our feeders. I don't do that anymore simply because uh, I got tired of, of uh, the harassment of the mice and the squirrels. So I don't do that anymore. But Jesus said, watch the birds. Aren't you more valuable than they? Of course they are. If God will take care of the birds, folks, he will take care of you, and he certainly will take care of me. But there's a second step. If I want to uh, find peace for my troubled heart, talk to God about everything. Talk to God about everything. Look what he said in, in Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Notice that he said, in everything, by prayer. And so, folks, have you discovered that you can't worry about something and pray about it at the same time? That's impossible to do. And so, instead of worrying about it, talk to God about it. One of my favorite hymns of the church is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. One of the lyrics to that song says it this way, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God and prayer. Someone says God won't put more on you than you can handle. Folks, that is simply not true. God never said he wouldn't put more on you than you can handle. Read the scripture closely. He said, I won't put more on you than I can handle. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So, don't you worry about anything, but pray about everything. All of these concerns that you have in your life, you just simply talk to God about them. Give them to God in prayer. After all, what is prayer? Prayer is simply the sincere desire of your heart. You just give it all to God in prayer. Then there's a third thing that we must do if we want to have peace in our hearts. Number three is you thank God in all things. Thank God in all things. Folks, listen up. 
God didn't give us the Bible to increase our knowledge. God gave us the Bible to change our lives. And so when we appropriate the Word of God into our lives, guaranteed it will change your life. Look again at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, that's what we're looking for, peace, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Notice what it says. It says, with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known unto God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. Here's what it says. It says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Somebody says, Well, you know, I have so many aches and pains uh, in, in my body. Well, thank God for those parts of your body that doesn't ache, that doesn't cause you pain. There's always something, folks, to be positive. So we need to stop accenting the negative, and we need to start thanking God for the positive. There's always something to thank God for. From the day of your birth, think about it, to a ride in the hearse, things are never so bad that they couldn't be worse. And that's true, folks. Remember those days uh, years ago on a Sunday night? We used to have Sunday night services. And uh, we would have testimonies. Someone was going through a test. And they would give up and they would give their testimony. Break that word testimony down. Test. Money. And so people would stand up and they would describe the test that they were going through. How God had blessed them and delivered them from that uh, test, provided the answers to that test, and so they gave their testimony. They would give their testimony. But many people, <laughs> after a test, well, they don't have a testimony. All they've got is monies. Heard about one lady that got up and she said, I thank God I have two teeth and she said they touch. What a testimony. There's always something to thank God for, for folks. Number four, Paul says, think about the good things. Think about the good things. Look again at Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Chapter 4 of the book of Philippians, one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. He says, finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. And so, folks, we all have choices to make. We can accent the negative, or we can start thanking God for the positive in our lives. Acts chapter 26, verse 2 says, I think myself happy. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thanks in his heart, so is he. You know what, folks? You don't have to work to think negative thoughts. Do you realize that? These negative thoughts just come automatically. But we do have to work to think good thoughts. You say, well, a person is a Christian. That doesn't mean that they think good and positive thoughts. Hey, folks, listen up. I've been around the block a few times, and I've pastored a lot of people over these 57 years, and some people sad to say, I have met that they are so negative that if they would walk into a dark room, they would develop 
Folks, we have to work at thinking good, positive thoughts. All I want to say to you is that the enemy will work overtime to tell you negative things. Somebody says, well, I've got these, uh, these thoughts of fear. Let me tell you something. That does not come from God because God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, listen closely, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Someone else says, well, I've got these negative thoughts about somebody. Well, think about something good in that person's life. Uh, when you think negative thoughts, friend, they're not coming, these thoughts are not coming from God. They're coming from our enemy. Then let me hurry on to say the last thing. If you're looking for peace, be content with anything. Look what Paul says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, contentment is not having any ambition. Paul was a very ambitious man of God. He wanted to reach the entire Roman Empire in his day. Certainly, looking at the life of Paul, he had ambition. Here's what contentment is. Here's the meaning of it. Contentment is enjoying what I already have and not waiting for something to happen to make me happy. Can I be personal? Can I be transparent? Can I be honest with you? I've always wanted to own a Dodge Ram truck. It had to be a big horn, either red or white. I've always wanted one of these Dodge Ram trucks. And when I would drive out in the city and I would see someone driving uh, a red or a white a Dodge Ram Bighorn, I would say to myself, there goes my truck. Oh, how I would love to have my truck. But you know what, folks? Uh, that uh, is not being contented with my 1994 Toyota truck. It has 253,000 miles on it, and it gets me from point A to point B. It has overdrive, and it has air conditioning. So why do I fret and stew over the fact that I don't have a Dodge Ram truck when God has kept the, uh, the Toyota running for me, and I maintain it uh, systematically, and it's a good truck for me? So I've learned... I've learned to stop looking at those Dodge Ram Bighorn trucks and I say, God, I'm so thankful for my 1994 Toyota truck with 253,000 miles on it. Contentment, folks, is enjoying what I have right now and not waiting for something to happen to make me happy. By the way, Contentment, break it down. Which tent do you live in? Stop and think about it. Do you live in the tent of content? Or do you live in the tent of discontent? Well, choice is yours. Somebody says, well, you know what? When I get married, uh, then I'll be happy. No, you won't. <laughs> Listen, get honest. If you're not happy right now, you're probably going to get married and make somebody else unhappy. Contentment is enjoying what I have right now. Stop and think about this. Who is more content? A man with a million dollars or the man with seven children? The answer is simple. The man with seven children because he doesn't want any more. Think about it, folks. John Wooden said it best. He said, things turn out best for those who make the best of how things turn out. Did you get that? I'll say it again. He said, things turn out best for those who make the best 
of how things turn out. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, how can I not worry? How can I talk to God about everything? How can I thank God in all things? How can I think about good things? And how can I be content with anything? <clears throat> Listen closely. God never tells us to do something without showing us how to do it. And my number one life verse is found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Look what it says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Folks, I learned a long time ago to become an eye canner. As a matter of fact, I gave a message many years ago on that subject, how to become an eye canner. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How can we do it? It's through Christ, my friend. We can do all things through Christ. Peace starts with Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking about as I was putting this message together, you know, I've tried to be nice to everybody. I really have. But some people, they just don't like me. And that's true of you. And so I don't stew over it. I am who I am by the grace of God. And I'm, I'm, I live for an audience of one, not the approval of other people. And so if I feel like there's somebody that is struggling in their life and they enter uh, my sphere of the world. Uh, maybe they're uh, having some challenges mentally. Uh, I have a heart for people who are facing challenges in their life. I really have a heart for them. Years ago, there was a young man by the name of Jimmy Holmes. He occupied... <coughs> office space in my office. Sometimes you would talk for two hours and I would just listen. He was a disabled vet and uh, he just poured out his heart to me and he was struggling with where he was uh, in life. I really have a heart, folks, for people who have challenges. Sometimes they become my very best friend. Got to be honest with you, I think we all have some mental challenges. Come on now, let's, let's get honest. Somebody says we're all ignorant just on different areas. I don't believe that. Instead, I believe we're all just smart, just in different areas. But you know something, folks? I was never in the in crowd. From childhood, adolescent, teenage years, young adult, and adult. I never was in the in crowd. I uh, tried to be in the in crowd, but uh, I was so introverted and so shy, and I really couldn't pronounce my words correctly in those early years. I wouldn't talk to people unless they first talked to me. And I would not carry on a conversation with them simply because I couldn't talk. Uh, even my, in my preschool years, same problem. Couldn't talk. So I grew up not having the ability to talk until the fourth grade. My dad ushered me into a speech therapist. And for two years... During the lunch hour, the speech therapist worked with me with my speech. Well, some of you have heard my story before, so I won't belabor the point simply to say at that time, uh, ever since then, I never was in the in crowd. I grew up being really shy and being an introvert. I felt so inferior to other people. I never was in the in crowd, even in my early years of pastoring, 
I wasn't in the in crowd. Still aren't, by the way, to tell you the truth. But folks, my eyes focused upon a scripture years ago. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Here's what it says. If any man be, notice, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so I study those two words, in Christ. And so thinking about it, I came to the conclusion a few years ago, well, maybe I am in the in crowd because we see the word there is a prefix to a lot of other words. So, when the devil brings up my past, it is inadmissible because of the blood of Christ. And my Heavenly Father has included me in his love. And somebody like me, I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. And he's given me a promise that's indisputable. He said he would never leave me nor forsake me. And he's taken my name and he has written it in the book of life. And so it is inerasable. And then I have a Bible. I have a Bible that's inspired by God. One day, I'm going to get a body that is incorruptible. One day, I'm going to get a crown that's immovable, and I'm going to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. I have riches here upon this earth that has been invested. I have a promise that's inevitable that God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Folks, I have a home in heaven that is indescribable. So we all can say, we who are believers, we are in the in crowd. That's the moment where you just say, Hallelujah. Say to one another, I am in the in crowd because we have established a personal relationship with Jesus. Someone says, God won't put more on us than we can bear. He never said that. He said, I won't put more on you than I can bear. That's why he said, cast all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. Again, the words of what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So, folks, these are the steps. If you're looking for peace, start taking them a step at a time. Now, you may be watching this message and you may be saying, Dale, you know, if the truth were known, I'm not really sure that I'm saved. I'm not really sure that my heart is right with God. I'm not really sure that I have a home in heaven when I die. Folks, eternity is too long to be wrong. You need to settle that situation right now. You need to have the peace of God in your heart so you can have peace in every situation that you may be confronted with. Here's how you do it. You pray a simple prayer and just repeat the words after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, but God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, and I confess them to you right now. Come into my heart. Come into my life and forgive me. 
Now thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, that I am right with you through Jesus Christ. So, folks, I have just shown you how you can find peace for your life and how you can minimize the stress in your life. Now it's up to you. I would pray that you would soften your heart and allow these words of God to sink deep into your heart and to your mind, and then you will find what you're looking for. And now may God be with you. Go with God, and He will go with you. Till I 